So our first panel for the day is Stories from the Field, and uh, this panel brings together four professionals from different domains uh, to share their stories about being a humanist at work, uh, their different career trajectories, and uh, the value of a PhD uh, in the workplace. And moderating the panel is Janelle Orcasitas, and uh, Janelle is a PhD candidate in literature and cultural studies at UC San Diego. Her research interests include Chicano and Chicana literature and film, science fiction, and speculative fiction. Uh, and she's currently teaching. Uh, she's currently a teaching assistant for the literatures in English multi-ethnic sequence at UCSD. Uh, with that said, Janelle. All right. Can you all hear me? No. Uh, hello. Yes. All right. It's not gonna work. Can you all hear me? A little? No. All right, so I'm just going to hold it like this for now. I am soft-spoken, so I do need this mic if you're, if you're going to hear me today. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Fernanda, for that introduction. I am Janelle again, and I'm going to be moderating the Stories from the Field panel with all of your amazing panelists here. And I'm very excited for you all to hear their stories and to learn a little bit more about their paths uh, from academia and to the careers that they're in now. I love Humanists at Work. I've been going since they had their first one in San Diego. And Stories from the Field is probably one of my favorite sessions. So to be here today is like a dream come true. So <laughs> I'm really excited, especially because it's the last one. So I'm, I really hope that you enjoy their stories and, and learn a lot because this is a really, um, great and powerful session and really sets the, the tone for the rest of the day, I think. So I'm going to do a quick introduction of each panelist, and then we'll get straight to the questions. So I'll start with uh, down here with Sylvie Liao. She is the Global Curriculum Development Manager at Rice Smart. She has worked on instructional design, curriculum development, and learning solutions in a variety of settings, such as startups, high-growing, and Fortune 500 companies. She earned her PhD in linguistics from UC Davis. And then to, to her, this is your left? <laughs> this is the, other, the other right, right? Uh, it's Simon Abramovich, and he is an English instructor at Chabot College in Hayward, California. He will earn his PhD in English from UC Davis this year. His teaching, research, and writing is focused on race, ethnicity, issues in the humanities, and multi-ethnic American literature. And then here we have Elizabeth Gessel. She is the Director of Public Programs at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. This is a contemporary art museum that celebrates black cultures, ignites challenging conversations, and inspires learning through the global lens of the African diaspora. Elizabeth earned her BA and PhD in history from UC Berkeley. And then finally, we have Dana Linda. She joined the Bay Area tech community in 2017 at Menlo Ventures. She works closely with Menlo's investment, marketing, and event teams to provide positioning and strategic guidance to both the firm and its portfolio. She graduated Pi Beta Kappa from UC Santa Cruz, where she earned a BA in Literature and Feminist Studies and holds a PhD in Comparative Literature from UC Los Angeles. So we will get started. Um, so I have all of these different tech <laughs> tools over here. So my first question is actually a question hopefully you're all familiar with, and you took the Google poll on your, on your table. So it's also the same question I'm going to start with because I think everyone has different definitions or understandings of what a humanist is and what that looks like. And so I wanted to have you all see what you put together. So this is what everyone's, I don't know if that was mine. I don't know if that, or this is everyone's responses in this word cloud and of course the ones that are the most prominent or the ones people used most of. So that makes sense. Everyone is a humanist at work. So we're on the same page, right? Um, but this is the question I'll start with. And hopefully, we'll all get to 
see some, from what they say, some of these, these ideas and these words resonate and, and mean something to all of us, because we are all connected in, in a way, and I think this, this just goes to show um, from what you know, we were initially asked. So we'll start with Dana, and the question is, how do you define a humanist at work, or what does a humanist at work look like? Can everybody, okay, you can hear me. Okay, great. Um, so we had this conversation briefing a few days ago, and um, uh, I had made this joke at work that I shared anecdotally with the group, uh, and I don't think it hit with my current community in the same way, but I work with venture capitalists, and one of the first questions I got from the recruiter that I was working with was, so your humanities major, how do you feel about capitalism? And thank you so much for asking me that. Um, and like nine months later, I make this joke at work that's like, I'm a venture humanist. And it like fell flat, nobody thought. <laughs> and I realized it's because they don't really know what a humanities major does. They kept calling me an education PhD, which thinking about it, maybe I should have gotten a degree in education, but I, I'm not a, an education PhD, I'm a comparative literature PhD. Um, but for me, you know, the humanities more broadly means thinking about myself as an educator uh, first, uh, as someone who mobilizes and advocates on behalf of people, places, and cultures that are different from myself, and I feel like that's an ethical position that I bring every day to the tech community, um, whether it's internally or publicly. Great. So how about we have Elizabeth next? Okay. Um, can you guys hear me? Is this on? Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, this is a tough question. Um, I, I feel like um, being a humanist at work means that I bring um, a very thoughtful and critical eye to everything that I do. Um, you know, I, because I work in a museum, I work in a humanist institution, so I don't have the problem of people not understanding um, what that means. But um, you know, all, every day my work is about celebrating the humanity of people through arts and letters and culture. Um, so I feel really lucky that that I have um, an alignment in um, my studies as a humanist and also my work as a humanist. Um, I feel like I bring a, a sort of a sense of reflection, um, reminding people in my workplace every day to really think about what, what choices we're making, um, how they impact the work that we're doing, the people that we're serving, um, the system that we're in. And um, I also think as a humanities PhD, um, one of the most important things that I bring to the workplace is um, really highly skilled writing. All of you out there, like that's your most important skill that you're going to bring to any job. Um, almost nothing goes out of the museum without me looking at it first. Um, just because I, I have writing skills and um, editing skills that most people don't. Um, so it's, it's part functional being a humanist and part um, philosophical, and it's nice in the workplace that those two things can come together. Good morning. It's working, I guess. Um, I'll say that my definition of what a humanist at work is has been evolving. And part of that is trying to figure out what a humanist is, what the humanities are. And that's something that thinking, reflecting on it, I've been thinking about before I even knew what the humanities were. Um, in high school when I was reading, uh, analyzing literature, how that related to problems that I saw you know, around uh, my school, my community. And seeing other people not reading those books and wondering, you know, how can this help me to figure out what's going on? Um, and that was before I knew, oh, the humanities are something that people study. And so, you know, over time, that, that kind of thinking has led me to think that, okay, a humanist at work is someone whose engagement with the humanities is directed towards figuring out how to live well. And that could be trying to get a job, um, as, as uh, David mentioned earlier, 
trying to figure out how, how to make processes more just, uh, make the society more equitable. So using the humanities to really figure out how, how can we all live well is the definition that I've now come to. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? No? You may have to bring it up to, you guys your, hear me? to your mouth slowly. You may have to do this. Already. How long now? Okay. So before I share my definition, um, I want to share your story. Uh, so while I was job, hunt, um, job searching, and I made it to final round um, and then talked to the executives. They went through my resume, and the CEO asked, oh, Doctor of Philosophy, Linguistics. So you major in philosophy? How's it like? <laughs> they don't know what Doctor of Philosophy means, and you want to talk about your research. Forget it. <laughs> so um, I think my definition of um, humanist at work is um, a humanist at work is an applied humanist. How you apply the skills you learned from your grad, from your grad training to So how you apply the skills you learned from your grad training uh, to your workforce, you know, the, the critical skills you have, the, the, the thinking process, you know, the, you know, the dialogue you have with yourself you know, all the time, you know, I'm sure, right? And, you know, the, the, the connection you make between A and B when you evaluate your work. So those are all the skills you apply to, to, the, to, to your workforce. So that's how I define a humanist at work. So, you know, whether you are able to transfer the skills you acquire to the work. Great, thanks everyone. That's a great segue into my next question of going into that process of translating those skills or going into a different field while still holding on to that same academic training and not losing that part of you because I think that's a big part of who we are. And so the next question is just what, what made you decide to you know, seek a career outside of academia, what was that transition like? What, just tell us a little bit about that story and how you got to where you are today. And we can start, do, we, do you wanna mix it up? We'll have Simon start, yep. put you on the spot. Okay, <laughs> although maybe I'm the least uh, distant in that I teach at a community college and I would, is it, I, it is outside academia, I guess, although um, in the past year, as I've been learning a lot more about community colleges and what they do, uh, who they serve, you know, we're providing general education the first two years of a college experience uh, for students. And in that sense, we do what a four-year university does to some degree, um, and, uh, and many, other, many other things as well. Um, and so when I was, you know, finished, you know, coming to the end of the PhD and really thinking about what I wanted to do afterwards, uh, the major question that I came across is, who do I want to work with? Who do I want to serve? And where do I want to be? And for myself as a parent of now two kids, um, as a partner, someone from the Bay Area, uh, someone who's roots and networks are here, it was important to me to kind of figure out how I could think about all of those things together. And uh, I applied to some other academic jobs half-heartedly, I think. And when I finally did apply to the community college, I realized in writing the you know, cover letter, repositioning my resume, and thinking about how I, would, how I would answer certain questions in the interview, I realized that a lot of what they were doing were the things that I was interested in um, and things that we're, we all are, are interested in here. You know, what, are, what do the humanities do for people? And those people can be doing anything from early, early childhood education, uh, working in auto mechanics, working in music, um, and so working with community college students and students who are going to go into all kinds of fields really gives me an opportunity to kind of 
think with them about what the humanities can do with that close reading and, and analytical skills, you know, how that can serve them. Um, and I guess that's, that's where I'll stop right now. Okay. All right, I'll, I get, I'll choose. We'll have Elizabeth go. Okay, um, so I was a history major and um, as an undergraduate and um, pretty enamored with the world of academia and it looked like a great avenue to pursue. Um, and so I you know, applied and got accepted to graduate school at Berkeley and um, was in the PhD program in history. And um, I would say, like, it, I guess it happened gradually, but it was about halfway through the PhD program that I, I just sort of looked around and saw that, you know, the, the world that I was being trained to be part of um, didn't look that appealing to me. Um, it, it, you know, a lot of the things that I didn't like about graduate school weren't going to change if I became a professor. Um, it, it just, it seemed like it wasn't for me. And it felt very personal, like, that it, that there was something about, um, what I was interested in and what my goals were, um, that wouldn't be served by becoming a professor in an academic setting. Um, but I also, you know, I committed this time and energy to it, and it sort of felt like it couldn't be bad to have a PhD from Berkeley, right? It would serve me well at some, in some way. So I decided, you know, and I, and I was getting enough support and teaching that um, I could finish and I could, you know, continue to live <laughs> while I was doing it. You know, it's not a bad job to have to be a graduate student and teach and live in Berkeley. Um, and like Simon, I also um, was starting a family. I had my first kid when I was writing my dissertation. And I'll let you all know, like, if you're having trouble finishing your dissertation, get pregnant. It's, like, <laughs> it's the best way to, to motivate you to. It didn't work for get, me. <laughs> OK. Well, like, it could work. It might not. Um, but yeah, it like, you know, made me sort of realize that it, it, I didn't have to have the best dissertation in the world. I just had to have one that was going to get passed with my committee. Um, <laughs> and I also learned how to work really efficiently because I like, would have a babysitter take my kid away for a couple hours a day, and I would work really, really hard and very focused while um, he was gone. And then you know, I didn't work the rest of the time. And I think probably most of us do like two hours of work a day, but we stretch it over a period of 10 hours. <laughs> um, so, um, so anyways, uh, so I had my kids. I also had my second child the day that I picked up my signature sheet. So he was like very um, cooperative, waiting until I had my signature sheet to come along. <laughs> Um, but that left me at the end, I, you know, now I had a PhD, I had two small kids, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and I didn't really know what, uh, I, how I could use my PhD to further um, figuring out what I wanted to do. Um, but I knew that I want, I still loved history, and I wanted to um, engage in teaching history in some level, but I didn't really want to teach in, a, in even a community college or high school. I thought of all those things, of course. Um, but as an undergraduate at Berkeley, I had participated in a, um, a program that actually was sponsored by UC Riverside. I don't know if it still exists. It was called the Education at Home Program. And you um, lived in Colonial Williamsburg and took classes at William and Mary. Um, and also I took a, one of the classes was taught by the director of Colonial Williamsburg and it was a public history class where you looked at um, teaching history in a museum setting um, and we traveled all over look, going to museums, going to historical sites and historical preservation um, sites and thinking about teaching history in that way. Um, I also didn't want to leave the Bay Area. I had a family. I, my husband had a job here. We didn't, I didn't want to really go anywhere else. Um, but there are a lot of museums here in the Bay Area, so I started thinking about um, going, working in a museum. Um, I had also, my PhD um, was on the Great Migration in Savannah, Georgia. I had done mostly African American and Southern history. And while I was home with my kids, 
the Museum of the African Diaspora opened in San Francisco. Um, and so I decided I should work there. Um, <laughs> so when I was ready to go back to work, I um, started volunteering there. I took an internship position in the education department there. I was probably the most overqualified intern they'd ever had in the uh, museum. But um, it taught me what I needed to know about what happens in a museum and how I, as a history PhD, could contribute um, and could be a part of making it a successful institution. Um, and while I was an intern, I started developing public programs. Putting on a I put on a lecture series that was um, connected to the exhibition that we were showing. And it felt kind of like teaching. It felt like I was researching a subject and I was pr putting together a lecture series and that, but I didn't actually have to do the lecturing, which was even better. Um, <laughs> and I brought in people and the public came and they learned about a subject and I learned about a subject um, that I didn't really know about and I've been hooked ever since. Um, I, when the, a job in public programs opened at the museum, I was there and I was offered it. Um, and I've been there for nine years. Um, and I'm now the director of public programs, and I put on all the events at this museum in San Francisco, and it, it's pretty amazing. It's a great job, and I feel lucky to have made the transition. Great. Oh, Sylvia? I have some similar experiences um, as uh, Elizabeth. Um, when I was working on my dis dissertation last year, um, I got pregnant. <laughs> and. So, you know, I had a lot of data that I want to analyze. I have a lot of chapters that I think I want to write, but, you know, it's tough to be pregnant. So my advisor told me, why don't you just cut two chapters and you'll know, save that for later when you get a tenure track position. You can use the data to publish, right? Which I never did. <laughs> um, so I think similar to what um, Simon and Elizabeth said, you know, I think family plays a very important role in how we make our decisions. Because my family is in the Bay Area, um, you know, my husband has a stable job. So it's unlikely that, you know, I will have to, if I want to get a tenure track position, I would have to move out of California, move out of the Bay Area to, to go somewhere. Um, so among the cohort who got a fac, uh, tenure track position, I, um, one was in Wisconsin, one was in Asia, the um, one was, um, I believe, UK. None of them stay actually within proximity. So that, that wasn't an option for me. And also I had a, a, a young baby at that time. Um, so, so I started thinking, you know, what, what should I do? You know, if eczema is not my option. And also when I was a grad student, um, they published a, a survey, um, apparently that only 12%, I don't know about the number right now because it was, about eight years ago already, but about only 12% of people stay in eczema, meaning 88% actually left. So, you know, so it, it's just, there's just not a, not a lot of opportunities for me. And, you know, my, uh, my major was in linguistics, right? So in the Bay Area, what are the, the, the universities that offer um, linguistics and also, you know, have kind of, um, concentration on, on my field, which is social linguistics. Narrow down to Berkeley and Stanford. <laughs> but do they have openings? Not really, right? So you, you, you'll know the reality. So, so I started thinking of my passion, you know, what I want to do. So I also had a master's degree in, um, in English education. So, you know, I'm very passionate about language learning, language acquisition. So that's also kind of my dissertation was on how um, identity and ideology affect dialect acquisition and language acquisition. So, so I think, okay, I, um, I want to explore opportunities in the, in, in the industry. But, you know, having a PhD doesn't, meet, doesn't guarantee you a job because you don't have any work experience they are looking for, right? So if you want to apply for, for, you know, for uh, a learning specialist, what professional experience do you have that you can put on your resume, ex you know, in addition to, 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 you know, the qualified paper you wrote, the dissertation you wrote, right? So, so to get into the industry, um, I, I was fortunate enough to, to find an intern um, 
internship um, opportunity at a startup company. And I think startup, they are easier to get into because, you know, they are less known and, you know, um, they, they, they don't really, um, well, um, um, they don't really acquire a lot more uh, work experiences as big companies and also uh, startups, they don't have uh, ATS, meaning the applicant tracking system to, to, kind of, to kind of screen you. So the, a human being will really read your resume, not like, you know, if you apply for Google, Facebook, you know, your resume probably won't get into a human being, you know, because computer will just, you know, eliminate you. So, so, so I applied for the internship there. Uh, it didn't really pay me anything. Uh, you know, actually it's much less pay than what I got as a TA at UC Davis. But I, I, I view that as an opportunity for me, you know, to, to go into the industry. So, and also as a startup, um, when I joined, there's only four people, four co-founders, and I was the fifth person. Um, the, the startup was doing a language learning app. So, you know, I was able to kind of apply the, the skill, the knowledge I have in kind of the, the uh, language acquisition and also kind of be their kind of content manager there. Well, as an intern. That's a fancy title I put on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, and at the startup, you know, because it's such a small team, you work with the CEO, they call them, all of them are CEOs or CFO, you know, they all have the C title because it's only four of them. <laughs> so, so, you know, you, you, and then, you know, in your next opportunity, you can say, oh, I work with the CEO, the CFO, you know, all the C level people. Um, so, so you work with the vendors, you work with kind of the, 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 C, the C suite people, and also you pick up kind of the skills, you know, uh, the QA, the quality assurance skills, you know, I, I need to avoid the jargons I use right now. So, in, uh, you know, the quality assurance skills, you know, kind of vendor event management, because, you know, at startup, you also have to wear so many different hats. You know, one person has to do so many different things. So, and uh, I was only there for a few months, but I was able to use kind of the skills I learned to help me land a full-time position at my next company which is Pearson, one of the biggest education companies. So, and then, you know, and I would think, I would say kind of a baby step for me. So to go from the kind of intern at the startup company to where I am right now. So, you know, when you go to a new company, you just learn a lot of skills, you know. Um, but um, I think, you know, I also benefit from, from the solid training I have because just as Elizabeth said, you know, I have better writing skills than most people at the company, which is true because, you know, I spend so much time, you know, working on my dissertation. And also, you know, kind of the critical thinking process I have is very different from, from other people. And my coworkers like to tease me because they said, why do you ask why all the time? <laughs> because that's what I do. When, you know, when I was working on my dissertation, I have to ask why, I have to answer why, right? So, you know, so, you know subconsciously, you know, I, 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 I also apply the skills I learned, you know, in workflow, in uh, workforce, so yeah, so that's uh, that's my my story. Great. Okay, Dana. So it's kind of funny how we've gone from like one end of the spectrum to again over here with the, the venture capitalists. Um, <laughs> so for me, it's fun. It's fun and funny to think about that my journey in in and out of the ten year track like started in this room. Uh, Rebecca Littman, who's my colleague at UCLA, dragged me to this event. I had no idea the changing conceptions of work. You know, it wasn't even on my radar because I was so zeroed in on exams and prepping for like the next step in the degree that I wasn't thinking outside of academia at all. I was completely had drank the Kool-Aid. I was going on the tenure track. Um, but thinking about it more, you know, I went to UC Santa Cruz as an undergrad and I was very lucky to be at an undergraduate focused institution where my TAs and professors took extremely good care of me as a student and really took the time to sort of harness my own sort of passions for academia early on. So I knew pretty early, like I'm sure a lot of us in this room, that I wanted to go into higher education. I'm also the daughter of an educator. So I always knew that education was going to be in my life in some way. And you know, about halfway through, I started thinking um, sort of more about 
how I have constantly put my work before everything else in my life, you know. Unlike everybody else here, I forestalled family planning and personal sort of, yeah, mental, physical wellness so that I could, you know, hustle through the, through the degree. Um, and it was coming, uh, you know, to that tail end penultimate step where I did go on the 10-year track half-heartedly uh, at the encouragement of my advisor when I was still dissertating and it felt like, you know, all kinds of chaos. I got an interview at SF State, which to me felt like that would have been a dream job in academia, but maybe not too, right? Like I have no idea. Um, and actually I was at another humanist network event when I got an offer for a visiting position right before I was about to finish um, down at Loyola Marymount and talking with Kelly and you know my colleagues um, from UCLA and Jared Reddick really helped me make a decision that was good for me at that time, which was to not accept a visiting professorship um, and to really prioritize where I wanted to be. I also grew up, uh, I was born and raised in the East Bay. Um, my, my, my family's here, my husband's here, and I knew that I was going to be staying in the Bay Area. So fast forward, you know, end of 2016, I go on the job market, the non-tenure academic track market, and I'm going to position myself for higher ed admin positions, right, because I can do that. And I had 17 interviews, like full cycle interviews, and each one was, thank you, but we're going to go with someone else. And sometimes that was an internal candidate, sometimes that was someone without a PhD. And I ran the gamut of everything from community college, and not just instructor, but actual program, programmatic work through um, research institutions like Berkeley and Stanford. And I realized that while I have a network here, my professional network isn't in the Bay Area. No one in my inner circles is in higher education. And so I substitute taught in my home uh, town in Castro Valley, just 15 minutes down the road from here. Uh, which was like a special kind of hell to go back to your own high school. <laughs> Luckily, I, I got to sub from one of my favorite teachers who's now a good friend, but I knew a long time ago I didn't want to teach high school. My dad's a high school teacher. My aunt and my uncle are high school teachers. Uh, and I, I did have a good time. I, I say that jokingly, but I knew that high school wasn't for me. I didn't want to work at a private uh, school with my degree. I wasn't feeling ready to go back and do a credential. So I just made the decision with the encouragement of my husband actually to speak with a recruiter. Because uh, we were on a ticking kind of time bomb of being able to afford to live here. Uh, so my husband works for the city and county of San Francisco and he actually, I'm gonna give him a major shout out because while I was finishing my PhD, he drove Lyft and Uber uh, 40 hours a week in addition to his full-time job. Yeah, so yeah, he's a great guy. Uh, <laughs> but I, so I was like apprehensive, right, to like work with a recruiter. I also didn't know how to work with a, a recruiter, even though I had best friends that were recruiters. I did not do a good job of like exercising my resources at this time. So I was on Indeed one day, and this job at California People Search came up, and I, it was this part-time job that like they clearly weren't going to take me for it. But I just applied, and the recruiter contacted me, and she's like yeah, they would never accept you for this position. It was in like real estate. So I was getting desperate, you guys. I was like, I don't know what to do. Um, and she's like, but you know, you're, given your skill set to your background, we have someone that we want you to work with. And I got so lucky. I ended up working with this recruiter who's based in Arizona, whose son had just finished a PhD in chemistry. And she was like the most wonderful person to have on my team while I was in this really sort of precarious state, both financially, right, like also just like internal dialogues that I was having with myself, like boosting my self-esteem. And having someone to advocate for me who understood, maybe not in an intimate level, what I studied and, you know, what I went through in a PhD, but as a parent who understood what their child, right, had gone through um, in a distant sense, but it was really helpful. And... I was going through two interview processes, both the one at my current job at Menlo Ventures and also at Stanford University in the medical department. Okay, I was open to it. Again, all programmatic sort of work. Um, and 
the interview at Menlo was so seamless. Like every, and it was a long process. I had six interviews with them. So this was like a month and a half almost long. Yeah, I was exhausted. Um, and every time I went in, it just, it, it felt a lot more natural and I felt more of myself um, in that interview process than maybe I had, you know, been able to represent earlier on during that six month stretch. Uh, and I just made the decision that, you know, working with good people um, was important to me and getting some experience at a smaller firm that has a lot of reach uh, would be a benefit to me. Uh, I, did I think of myself in this room, you know, way back when that I was going to be working with venture capitalists? Absolutely not. Like, if you would have told me that back then, I would have said, no, thank you, you know. Um, but this is the Bay Area sort of reality today that this is where a lot of the jobs are. And so much of the skills that we all have are very much needed in tech. Um, and I think something that I bring to my job every day now is like I'm constantly, you know, the thorn in the side, the why. Like think, think with intention about what you're doing and who you're impacting. And just getting the folks that I work with who have a lot of financial pull in this regional community to think, think about the choices they're making, think about how they're you know, acting on uh, decisions that affect like, not only their small, you know, very elite bubble, but has rippling effects throughout this community. As someone who's from here, that's really important to me. Um, and I'm still in transition, like I'm only nine months in. So it still feels very fresh. I'm still learning what it means to be in a nine to five environment again. And like actually like punching out at nine to, or you know, yeah, today, five, um, leaving at the end of the work day. So those are just sort of the more like, you know, nitty or gritty or things about transitioning out of academia that have been like a wellness check for myself. Really important. Great. So, do you I, want to jump in, Simon? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to, to add that. I mean, I think that for all, you know, all of us up here, um, family or geography did play a role in what we ended up doing. But I, I think it's important to say that, at least for myself, and I'm going to maybe extend it for you all, that um, that helped us. It wasn't that we said, or for myself, it wasn't that I said, oh, yeah. I guess I'll just choose my family and staying in the Bay Area and then just whatever, figure something out. It helped me to think about what it was that uh, my particular skills and passions, how could they be brought to bear in another way that is gonna, that is gonna be valuable um, to myself, you know? And, and I think that that personal aspect that pushes you to think ab about alternatives is the way that I've thought about humanists at work is that hopefully those alternatives can start to be thought of without necessarily having to go through these personal uh, balancing acts of like what, what am I going to prioritize um, that you can the, those alternatives will be actual choices just from the get-go instead of coming to the point where you have to you know go through those iterations like because of these other personal aspects of your life, you know? Um, and I, like I said, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn for you all, but that's, that's what happened for me. Um. Great, so I wanna have Q&A soon, but I, I do have a question that um, I'd like to bring up, but we, we don't have as much time, so maybe it'll come up with Q&A, but maybe we can start the conversation, and it's, um, similar to what Dana was saying, it's important with who you work with, and it's it's you know it's been kind of echoed. There's a different environment and how you're perceived. So, my question is, how does your workplace address or talk about diversity or inclusion, and how does that compare to the university and, and your experiences? So, maybe you just say like a tidbit, and then maybe it'll come up again. But I think it's an important question. Well, I think uh, right now in Silicon Valley and also especially the, the, the tech uh, uh, field, they really emphasize diversity because, you know, a lot of companies, you know, 
you know, they are monitored because, you know, because of lack, lack of diversity. So I think, you know, companies, they, they are definitely working on it. And, you know, it's a minority at the company, you know, Asian women. Um, so, you know, if you can prove your work, um, I'm sure um, you, you can make your way up. Um, but of course, you know, um, I know in some of the traditional field, um, it's, it's still difficult. But I, I feel that in the, the tech field, um, a lot of people are addressing this issue. Um, so as a white woman who works at the Museum of the African Diaspora, um, I'm in a diverse environment where I am not the dominant um, you know, person of my background. Um, and it is a choice that I've made because of um, the type of of scholarship that I did and what what I value and what's important to me um, and you know it, it's not always easy but that's a, that's like why I do it right um, and it's also you know just because I work in um, an environment that is primarily black that doesn't mean that there aren't issues around diversity and inclusion. Um, it's something that we talk about every day at work. And again, like that's something that's important to me. It's, it's very front and center. Um, and I felt like that wasn't necessarily true in academia. Um, and even being at Berkeley, which was you know, much more diverse than most places, I knew that if I went somewhere else, I probably wouldn't be in a situation that was as diverse. Um, also, working in the nonprofit world, for better or for worse, it's pretty female dominated. Um, so most of the people who I work with are women. My directors over the time that I've been there have always been women. Um, and I know like particularly right now, there are a lot of issues around sexism and um, gender inequality, especially in history departments. Um, and so I, I feel like I'm lucky to have avoided that issue. Some of my closest friends who are in the history profession um, are really having a hard time with um, the way that they're treated in their departments across the country. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that we're, we live in America, right? So no matter where we are, we're going to have to deal with this issue. But um, I feel like I've been able to put myself in a position where um, it, it's, it's being dealt with in a way that feels good and useful to me. Dana or Simon? Do you have I guess just say really quickly, like I work in Silicon Valley. Like, is it that different than academia? Not really. Um, we just appeared on like a top some odd number of VCs that are considered diverse in Silicon Valley. But if you look at the demographics of my office, we're not diverse at all. So I think tech still has a long way to go, as does academia uh, on that same front. There's interest within the VC community to talk about these issues, but a lot of that has been kind of like coming from a place of forced conversation. Um, my, my firm's trying to handle it as best they can, but they kind of want to just blaze through everything, you know? Like it's something to check off a box as, a, as opposed to making a real cultural change. So we're trying to take a few steps back and think about, think about that thoughtfully and intentionally of how to, how to bring right, um, differentiated groups and communities into the tech community organically and not just for a numbers game. Can we change diversity and inclusion to discrimination and injustice? Um, I feel like those are more accurate ways of describing what it is that we're actually confronting. Um, and that's, that's true in, you know, at my institution now, as well as the university. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, get, I could say a lot about this, but I guess my experience in the university, uh, getting a PhD, studying race and ethnicity, and you know, what, interacting with others who are teaching and learning uh, those same issues, knowledge and 
let's put it like that, uh, studying race and ethnicity and actually uh, addressing that in terms of bodies like faculty and student are two different things. And when I was thinking about what kind of job I wanted to have and where I wanted to work, that was something that I, I thought about, you know, who is actually going to be at some of these institutions that I might want to work? Uh, are they people that I would want to work with? Are they people that I could collaborate with, um, you know, to address some of the problems that I see? So, uh, yeah, I, we can go on, but I'll stop it there. So when I was talking about diversity, I was actually thinking of you know diversity in, in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity. But now that I think about it, I I think that the tech companies they are indeed addressing you know diversity in terms of race. But you know there's kind of the you know the the hidden um, uh, unconscious bias people still have. That's you know di diversity in terms of in terms of age. And I feel that ageism is very common in, in the high tech. So, you know, I start, you know, I start, you know, not revealing, you know, the year I graduate so people don't calculate how old I am. But, you know, sometimes you still get to ask the question, oh, because I don't put, you know, the year I graduate from college or the year I graduate from PhD, they ask, so which, what, which year did you graduate? In order to calculate, you know, your real age. So, you know, it's, I, I think this is a hidden, you know, a bias that a lot of companies still have, even though they, they don't recognize it. And they can't ask you that, so don't yeah. answer it. Like, I don't think they can ask you that. Yeah, they can ask you that, but you know, they can ask you how old you are, but they can ask, oh, so what year did you graduate? Right. Okay, so thank you. That was quick. I know this is like a bigger topic, so maybe we'll talk more about it. So my final question, uh, and you can give short, sweet answers is uh, what do you value most about what you do? And so this is another word cloud that we all answered. So this is a lot of what you said. You really value teaching, your abilities, ideas, and students, and being creative. So this is just what you all were thinking and how you were feeling. So how about our, our panelists? What do you value most about what you do? And Intersectional and feminism. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's it. That's all I'm going to say so we can yeah. keep going. Um, I, I value that I am um, part of an institution that highlights and emphasizes the art and culture of people of African descent and bring it to the rest of the world. I value the opportunity. The opportunity to think with others, my students and my colleagues. I value the creative aspect I put into my work. Great, thanks. Those are really great shorts. <laughs> so now we'll, we'll open it up for questions.